Hey friends, Anne here and welcome back to worship. I am so glad that you all are joining us for worship today. I want to start out with a question. Have you ever prayed earnestly for something? Earnestly meaning that you are praying persistently. You're praying with passion. You are praying for God's power to be made known in some area of your life or in the world or in someone else's life. Have you ever prayed earnestly? Right now, I am praying for a couple of different things very earnestly. Praying for a lot of things, but a couple of things very earnestly. I'm praying for my friend Sam to come home from the UAE. I'm praying for God's provision to be made of specifically $700 to finish a building project for a family whose home collapsed on them. I'm praying earnestly for these things. What are you praying earnestly for? What are you praying persistently for? If you just want to share with us, we can join you in your prayers. You can drop those things in the comments, and we would love to be joining you in your earnest prayer. But some of you may be asking, what is earnest prayer? What does that look like? What does it mean? And why should we pray earnestly? How is that different than other prayers that we may pray? So today we're going to actually dig into Acts chapter 12, and in Acts chapter 12, we're going to see an example of a time when the church was praying earnestly for something, and we'll see how God met them in that need. So let's go ahead, <clears throat> and before we even get started in Acts, I want to look at this idea of earnest prayer. And when you think about praying earnestly about something, what comes to mind? What picture comes to mind? For me, I really think of this time when Jesus showed us what earnest prayer was. In Luke chapter um, 22, verse 44, it says this, he prayed more fervently that's another word for earnestly. He prayed more fervently, and he was in such agony of spirit that his sweat fell to the ground like great drops of blood. Some people believe that he was praying so earnestly and so fervently that he was actually sweating blood. Others say, well, no, it was just that his sweat was just big like drops and heavy and thick like drops of blood. It doesn't matter. The point is that Jesus was praying fervently and earnestly. So let's go ahead and dig into Acts chapter 12, and we're going to start with verse 1 and see what we can learn about earnest prayer, what that looks like. So here we go. Verse 1 says this, about that time, King Herod Agrippa began to persecute some believers in the church. He had the apostle James, John's brother, killed with a sword. When Herod saw how much this pleased the Jewish people, he also arrested Peter. This took place during the Passover celebration. Then he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. But while Peter was in prison, the church prayed very earnestly for him. So here we find that once again, we've been reading in the book of Acts about the persecution of the early church and all that has been happening and the atrocious, horrendous things that have been happening to people because they have believed in Jesus. And Herod continues that persecution. But notice the reason why he continued it. I mean, he at first just said, hey, I just want to please the people, right? And when he saw that um, that when the apostle James was killed, that the people were all pleased, then he said, well, let's keep doing this. He wasn't even persecuting people because of what he believed. He was persecuting people to please other people who wanted to persecute the early church. And so Herod did this just for his own gain, for his own vanity. And he did this to be popular and to please the people that he was ruling. And then we also noticed that Herod's power, 
what he tried to use as his power paled in comparison to the power of the people who were praying. So Herod's power was prison and four squads of four soldiers each. So 16 soldiers were watching um, Peter as he was placed in prison, were arresting him and putting him in prison. And that was Herod showing his power. But then we look at the power of the believers. They were praying earnestly. And the thing is, Herod had no idea about the power of earnest prayer. He had no clue that these 16 soldiers and these, and these bars in this jail were no match for the power of earnest prayer. So let's look at that word earnest for just a moment and see if we can gain a little bit more understanding of what that really means. So when we look at the word earnest in the original language, what we find is that it means earnestly, strenuously, fervently, a medical term meaning to stretch to its limits. So this is not the kind of prayer that you just flippantly say, oh, God, bless this person, or, or God, please be with Peter in jail. That is not prayer that stretches us to our limits. That is prayer that many of us say every day, and it's good to pray that way, but sometimes when things are so important to you, when things are so necessary and needed, when you know you don't have anywhere else to turn, we are called and we are prone to pray urgent earnest prayer that stretches us to our limits, that we think, I can't even pray any longer or harder about this. And the thing that I want us to realize is also that as we pray earnest prayers, not only are we asking God to come through, but those earnest prayers change us. They change us on the inside. They remind us of who is the one that meets all our needs, who is the one that provides for us, who is the one who is in control. Earnest prayer not only speaks to the Father, but in the act of praying fervently and earnestly, stretching ourselves to the limits of our ability to pray, we realize that it changes us. It makes us more like Jesus. It makes us conform to his image, and it connects us with the Father in a way that it doesn't change the Father, but it changes us to be in conformance with his will. So this is how the church was praying for Peter, praying earnestly, fervently, being stretched to their limits. And let's see what happens next. The night before Peter was to be placed on trial, he was asleep fastened with two chains between two soldiers. Once again, this is Herod's only method of exerting authority and power, chains and soldiers. Others stood guard at the prison gate. So there was a prison gate that would have been sealed, and then there were guards on the other side. Once again, this was the only power that Herod had at his disposal. Suddenly, there was a bright light in the cell, and an angel of the Lord stood before Peter. The angel struck him on the side to awaken him and said, Quick, get up! And the chains fell off his wrists. All of this power that Herod had was nothing compared to the power of God. Then the angel told him, Get dressed and put on your sandals, and he did. Now put on your coat and follow me, the angel ordered. So Peter left the cell following the angel, but all the time he thought it was a vision. He didn't realize it was actually happening. They passed the first and second guard posts and came to the iron gate leading to the city, and this opened for them all by itself. So they passed through and started walking down the street, and then the angel suddenly left him. So here Peter is, he has escaped from prison by the power of God, and he just can't even imagine that this is true. Because he was asleep before, he thought, well, I still must be dreaming. This can't be real, because all this power was around him, confining him and keeping him in, and yet God loosed all of that. 
And we continue on. Peter finally came to his senses. It's really true, he said. The Lord has sent his angel and saved me from Herod and from what the Jewish leaders had planned to do to me. Friends, wow, what an answer to earnest prayer. What an answer to their fervent prayer. And it was answered in a way that Peter himself couldn't even believe. He didn't even expect it to happen this way. If we look at earnest prayer, I want to look a little bit and explore what it's not and what it is. So earnest prayer is not a guarantee. Just because you pray for something earnestly doesn't mean that God is guaranteed to give you exactly what you want in the way that you want it, in the time that you want it. It's not a transaction. It's not, well, I'm going to connect with God because he will do this thing for me. We need to realize that in earnest prayer, we need to connect with God because he is the one who has the authority and the ability and the power to do what needs to be done. Earnest prayer is not an attempt to change God. It's not an attempt to, God, this is your will. I'm sure it's your will, but I need you to change your will on this. Earnest prayer is a way to build your faith. Friends, can you imagine the amount of faith that Peter had once he had seen God move in this miraculous and mighty and powerful way? Can you imagine in just a moment what we're going to hear is how much the faith of the believers was boosted because of their earnest prayer? Earnest prayer is a way to change us. It's a way to change our perspective. It's a way to change the way we see things and the way we interpret things. It's a way to change who and what we look to for certainty and provision. Earnest prayer is simply and and most a connection with God. It's a way for us to pray unceasingly. It's a way for us to pray continuously, not just to offer a tiny little prayer about something that we care about, but don't really um, think that it's worth our while to stretch ourselves to the limit of prayer. It's something that we want to prevail in. It's something that we want to travail in. It's something that we want to continue on in and allow ourselves to be changed through this connection that we have with the Father. And so let's continue on and see how the believers respond to the answer of their earnest prayer. It says this, When he realized this, he went to the home of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many were gathered for prayer. And we know what kind of prayer this was. He knocked at the door in the gate and a servant girl named Rhoda came to open it. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed that instead of opening the door, she ran back inside and told everyone, Peter is standing at the door. Can you imagine, here Peter is, he has just escaped from jail, he has just been let out by an angel, he is probably confused and joyful and overwhelmed, and he just wants to connect with his people and tell them what has happened, and Rhoda sees him knocking at the gate, hears his voice, leaves him at the gate, turns around, and she is so excited and surprised by what has happened, the answer to their earnest prayer, that Peter is left out outside the gate, just waiting. And this is what happens next. You're out of your mind, they said. When she insisted, they decided it must be his angel. Friends, they were praying earnestly and didn't even completely believe that what they were praying for could be answered. Have you ever been in that place where you continue on in prayer, but yet there's a seed of doubt inside of you? And you say, I don't even know if this is possible. I don't know if God is hearing my prayers. I don't know if it's actually going to happen. And then when it does, you're caught off guard and you're surprised because you almost couldn't believe the very thing that you were praying for could be answered. Friends, earnest prayer is powerful prayer. It moves things. It shakes things. 
It causes things to be released and bound in our lives and the lives of other people. Continue to pray and be watchful because God might actually answer your earnest prayer. Meanwhile, Peter continued knocking. When they finally opened the door and saw him, they were amazed. He motioned for them to quiet down and told them how the Lord had led him out of prison. Tell James and the other brothers what happened, he said, and then he went to another place. So there he was, He had just been released from this powerful jail, ruled by this powerful man. And he went to tell the people who were praying powerfully for him what had happened as a result and a response to their prayers. They were amazed. Their faith grew. Their belief in what God could do grew. And Peter didn't sit still. He continued on. He continued on. He didn't just go hide away from Herod. He knew that he had been released for a purpose, to continue to share the gospel, to continue to spread the good news. And that's exactly what he did. So friends, I don't know about you, but my own prayer life is challenged here. And I want to know, okay, what does it look like to pray earnestly? I want to give us three key points about what earnest prayer looks like. The first one is this, that it is persistent. Earnest prayer is not something that we just pray one time and then say, well, I asked for it. Earnest prayer is persistent. You keep praying and praying and praying. Notice in our scripture today that this was a a period of several days that they were praying earnestly. Sometimes the things that we pray for are over weeks or even months. I know that for Zam, my friend who is in the UAE that has been wanting to come home, we have been praying for her for months now. Earnest prayers, deep prayers for Zam to come home. Pray persistently. The next thing that I want you to know is earnest prayer is passionate prayer. It's not just half-hearted or half-attempted. It is passionate prayer where we put all of our emotions and our thoughts and our feelings into being present with God in that moment, sharing with him the things that we are feeling and the doubts that we have, the wonders and the, and the um and just the amazement that we feel that we could connect with him in this way. Earnest prayer is passionate prayer. And finally, earnest prayer is precise. Earnest prayer isn't just a general, God, just do whatever you want in my life. Earnest prayer is interceding very specifically on a a very particular precise issue where we say, God, this is the thing that I want you to come through on. This is the thing where I need you the most. This is what is in need of your touch and your power and your might. Earnest prayer is persistent. It's ongoing. It's passionate. It's full of feeling and emotion and energy. And it is precise. We are stating this is the precise problem. This is the specific situation. And God, we need you. Only you can come through. So friends... How is your prayer life? Are there things in your life that you feel like you need to be praying earnestly, but maybe it's lacking persistence? Or maybe you're lacking passion because you're just tired of praying. You've been praying for so, so long and you haven't been seeing answers. Friend, continue, persist with passion. And be very specific and precise. God, this is what we're praying for. This is what we're longing for. This is the situation. And when we do, we surrender our will to his will. And we say, God, may your will be done in your power, in your way. But this is the desire of my heart. This is where I need you to come through. This is where my friend needs you most. Friends, I hope that today you will be challenged to embrace 
earnest prayer and watch what God will do. Will you pray with me? Father, today my earnest prayer is that all of us in this group watching this video, reaching out for a connection today, will be filled with the desire to pray earnestly for things in our lives. God, that we will be filled with passion, that we will have endurance in our prayer, and God, that we will precisely and specifically name the thing that you are urging us to name, the thing that you are urging us to come and leave at your feet. God, help us be people of earnest prayer. And then God, open our eyes for what you will do. Open our eyes to see the unexpected way that your power is manifested. Open our eyes to see the answer that sometimes is knocking right outside of our door, but we are too blind to see it. God, give us the power and the persistence to pray earnestly and the vision to see you answer it. In your name I pray, amen. I'm returning to the secret place with just an altar and a flame. Love is found here in a secret space. In your voice, I see your face. You're still my first. There's a table just for you and me. Break the bread and pour the wine. Perfect union, nothing in between. I am yours and you are mine. You're still my first love. Oh, 
chance I want to stay forever like this May the flame of my heart will always be lit But I want to burn forever like this You're still my first girl You're still my only one Yes you are You're still my first girl You're still my first love You're still my only one So friends, today we have heard that earnest prayer connects us with the Father and it changes us. And it changes others that it creates in us this posture of submission where we are willing to give ourselves over to God in prayer that is persistent and passionate and precise. So we have been ending every message with this one question. And the question is this, who is your one? We have this challenge for each of us watching these videos as a part of Digital Discipleship in the Chapel Online, each of us to reach one other person with the good news of the gospel. And this week, the challenge is the same, that you would find one other person and that you would sit down with them once a week, two people with six questions. And that goes along with Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, bear one another's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. What is the law of Christ, you say? Well, it is to love God and love others. And when we bear one another's burdens, that is one of the ways that we can fulfill the law of Christ. So who in your life needs you to pray earnestly for them? Who in your life needs you to persist and persevere in prayer? Find that other person. Have two people with six questions and begin to figure out how you can pray earnestly for each other. What are your six questions? They're the same every single week. We'll go over them now and notice that they will be posted after this video. The first question is this, what did you hear from God this week? The second question, how did you respond? The third, what brought you joy? And the fourth, where did you struggle? The fifth question is, how have you loved others? And then the sixth is, how can I pray for you? How can I pray earnestly for you and persistently for you? How can I persevere in fervent prayer for you? Friends, I hope that you will take this 6-2 challenge, six questions, two people, one time a week, and bear each other's burdens because that's what it looks like to reach someone else with the good news of the gospel. That's what it looks like to be disciples who are making disciples. And also, one of the important things that we do here at the Chapel Online is that we provide a reading guide for you each and every week so that you can be digging into the Word of God. We're reading through the book of Acts, and we will continue that this week, so I hope that you will join us. And don't forget to join us back next week as we continue our exploration through the book of Acts and continue to watch how God is meeting the needs of the early believers in the early church each and every step of the way. I hope that you all are blessed. I pray that you will persevere in earnest prayer this week, and I will see you back again soon. I feel my heart beating out of my chest. I want to see forever like this. The flame of my